Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk to you now for a little while about Judith Sargent Murray. You have a uh, couple of um, posts to make on Tuesday by 11 o'clock about Murray. Uh, her text is available on page 772 of the Norton. I encourage you to also read the biographical material, the introduction on page 770-71. It's short and it's informative and her life is interesting. Um, so I'm just going to um, do a few PowerPoint slides with you about Murray. Uh, and um, then when you go to the discussion, so read the text. Presumably you've read it before you're looking at this PowerPoint, but maybe not. And then, you know, note the places in the text um, that are interesting to you that um, that enhance what I'm telling you about here or that I haven't said anything to you about, the, but that you've noticed in the text. And then go to Blackboard, find your group. Everybody's sorted into a discussion group and answer the question um, that I've asked you on the discussion board. So, Murray's dates, 1751 to 1820. We're moving now uh, into the Revolutionary period. Um, Murray is uh, the first woman writer we've read in a little while. I think, uh, gosh, I think Bradstreet was maybe our, our last woman writer. So, you know, it takes a while for women to get um, into the public sphere in the in the written word in in the early United States. So. Murray, 1751 to 1820. Uh, like a lot of our uh, writers, Murray is um, born in Massachusetts. She's born in Gloucester. She's well-educated by socially and religiously liberal parents. Her parents were moving away from Puritanism toward uh, Unitarian Universalism. Uh, Unitarianism, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who you might be familiar with, was a Unitarian minister for a little while. Unitarianism is moving away from the really negative perception of the humans, uh, human beings as uh, completely depraved, as you'll recall the Puritans conceived of, of human beings that were essentially fallen and bad. Uh, Unitarianism rejects that. Uh, Unitarianism argues that we are inherently good. And not only that, it rejects the doctrine of election um, and proclaims that salvation was available to anyone who accepted Jesus Christ. So Murray's parents are Unitarians. She's raised in that doctrine. And this, um, you know, more uh, sort of expansive idea of human possibility certainly influences Murray's belief in the potential equality of women. She marries two Unitarians, uh, not at the same time, obviously. In 1769, she marries a guy named John Stevens. And then when he dies, she marries John Murray uh, in 1788. Uh, neither Stevens nor Murray ever makes very much money, and as is often the thing that pushes women into writing, Murray, Murray looks to make some money from her pen. She writes largely for magazines, um, spurred, as I've written here, to write not only to share her ideas, but to make some money. Um, magazines were becoming very popular in the 18th century. Um, they're seen as a really sort of virtuous and useful way to spread knowledge and understanding to common people. Um, she's writing largely for Boston's Massachusetts Magazine, and the essay that you guys read for today, for this Tuesday, was published in 1790. Uh, it's hard to make a living by writing. She never gets rich, but um, she does publish a collection of essays that she published in Massachusetts Magazine in 1798 in the Gleaner. Um, which uh, was, I think, three volumes. She was quite prolific, wrote a fair bit. Uh, on this specific essay on the equality of the sexes, um, the thing that I really want us to pay attention to is that it embodies the rhetoric and ideas of the Enlightenment. Um, review the ideas of the Enlightenment from your notes from before break. Um, and I think once you've done that and keeping it in mind when you read the essay, she very much appeals to logic. She essentially argues that um, gender inequality doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Uh, she says it's not reasonable. It, it, there's no way, she argues at one point, that, that God would make us to be inherently to uh, incapable, us meaning us women. She also relies, as the Enlightenment encourages one to do, on the evidence of the senses to prove gender equality, or at least the possibility of it. Um, 
At the same time, and we're going to find this when we get to Thomas Jefferson, at the same time that the essay calls for equality, Murray isn't saying that everyone is equal. She's not saying that every woman is equal to every other woman or that every woman is equal to every man. Um, one of the things I'd like you to pay attention to is who is she leaving out here? Um, and why does she leave some people out? What is her argument for um, really, I, I mean, I'm reluctant to say elitist, but it is kind of an elitist vision. She's perfectly comfortable with the idea that, you know, some women just aren't aren't able to be um, on an equal footing with men. They're not equal to one another. They're not equal to men. Um, and that's that's um, fairly typical for the time period, uh, depending on how much you know about American history. Um, you know that uh, in the founding of the Republic, uh, all men are created equal. That statement creates a lot of problems. Um, not all men are created equal, and the people who can vote are land-owning white males. Um, we're going to move away from that um, in our in our the arc of our history we're going to develop a more expansive notion of what it means to be equal but Murray is very much a part of her time and her generation in being pretty comfortable in, in leaving out pretty big big chunks of the population in terms of who she thinks is equal to who else um, I want to give you just some brief background on the social context at the time uh, Murray is, and if you look in your Norton on page 771, there's a nice little illustration there called Keep Within the Compass. Um, and what it illustrates for you is this notion of separate spheres that men and women, here's a nice color plate um, from the British Library, um, um, this notion that men and women should keep to distinct parts of um, society. Uh, you know, the, the, the circular sort of the area around this illustration here, keep within the compass and you shall be sure to avoid many troubles which others endure. So there is our happy woman keeping within her compass. Um, she's thrifty, we see by her bag. Um, she sticks to home. Her treasure chest is full. Um, and these are the things that happen to women outside of the compass. They have uh, misery at home. They're drinking too much and just generally being profligate, profligate, you know, um, uh, spendthrifty. They're out on the street, uh, this poor gal in the bottom left hand <laughs> crying. Um, just all the terror. This woman is being flogged. Uh, I don't know why. I, that's kind of a grim image. Um, prudence produceth, produceth esteem. So the prudent woman is esteemed in society and she is therefore safe. Um, specifically, the things that a woman needs to do um, to be considered um, genteel or to be, be considered appropriately feminine. Um, we call this the cult of domesticity. It's also called the cult of true womanhood or the cult of the lady. That word cult is a little misleading. It's not, you know, it's not like guys in orange robes collecting money at the airport culty. It's not, you know, Charles Manson culty. It's an ideology. It's a, it's a very rigid way of thinking about gender roles. And what it entails Piety, um, to, be, to be faithful. It requires a devout belief in Christianity, stressing woman's role as helpmeet and not partner. So you're not an equal, you are a helper. You have a very specific role. Um, the cult of domesticity dictates that a woman should be pure, and this is a specific kind of purity, a sexual purity. Demands chastity before marriage, um, so no sexual relations at all before marriage, and fidelity presumably to one's husband, of course, afterward. Um, so sexual purity, uh, submissiveness required that a woman obey her parents and later her husband and um, should neither parents nor husband be present, whoever the dominant male is in her family circle. That might be a brother, it might be an uncle, um, it could even be a son. Uh, domesticity, last but not least, uh, promulgates the, this doctrine of separate spheres, which I was just uh, illustrating for you with that, that um, illustration in the preceding slide. It emphasizes that a woman's place is in the home 
and a man's places in the world. So men are to be out in the marketplace making money, engaging with other men. Women are to be in the home caring for children. Uh, they're to center their lives on the home and thus uh, the home is perceived as a refuge for middle class white men and a proper sphere for their wives. And obviously this has racial limitations as well. If you are an enslaved person, an enslaved black woman, you do not have access to the cult of domesticity. We're going to talk more about that um, when we get to um, Charlotte Temple. Outside the home, women are to participate exclusively in church-related activities. So if you're going to be politically active, um, it, would, it would need to be a sort of Christian um, uh, sanctioned activity. Um, uh, sobriety societies, non-alcohol, I'm having a hard time remembering what those societies are called. Um, temperance, excuse me, temperance societies. Those were sort of sanctioned Christian groups. They promoted, um, you know, uh, sobriety and were sort of a safe place for women to get engaged in in social activities outside of the home. This, of course, is going to sort of lay the groundwork for women to get involved in abolition and then later on in um, in activity to, to get the vote for women for the rise of suffrage, but that's, that's a ways down the line here. So that is Judith Sargent Murray. These are the things that she is interested in and worrying about. Um, I will post this PowerPoint for you on Blackboard. Please get to your discussion questions uh, before 11 o'clock on Tuesday and let me know if you have any questions. See you guys.